thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to speak to you tonight. I'm Sarah williams Plantero. I'm the founding director of the South Texas Diabetes and Okay. All right. Um, and I was asked to share with you my thoughts about the vision for the development of the Institute and what we hope the impact of the Institute will be on the region. And today is a particularly appropriate and auspicious day to be talking about the promise of the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute and what it holds for the Valley. Because today, this Chinese New Year. So Happy New Year. <laughs> Uh, the Chinese calendar is on a 12-year cycle, with each year represented by a different animal. And this year is the year of the ram. The ram is a highly valued animal, so the year is, of the ram is thought to be a year of promise and prosperity. <coughs> and 2015 is a year of promise, since the newly formed South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute, which is beginning its operations in 2015, is seeking to find new, more effective treatments for diabetes and obesity. So what I want to do tonight is talk about our vision for the Institute, that is, what it will mean for science and what it will mean for the residents of the Valley and the world, and then to let you know how we anticipate the Institute will develop over the next five years. And finally, to outline for you what we hope the Institute will look like 20 years from now. The South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute is being established to advance research of diabetes and obesity because through basic biomedical research, we can develop better treatments and ultimately improve the health of residents in South Texas and beyond. Diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in the U.S. and is highly prevalent in this region, making the valley a prime location to examine the genetic determinants of susceptibility to and severity of diabetes. As the UTRGD president, uh, Dr. Guy Bailey, noted in his comments regarding the establishment of the Institute, as UTRGD and the School of Medicine come to fruition, we are focusing on connecting science and research with the South Texas community. Through the Institute and the Medical School, we are working to create the best possible outcomes for patients through research, clinical care, and education. The University of Texas has made a huge commitment to the Institute and to UTRGD School of Medicine as was evident at the announcement of the opening of the Institute. The leadership of the UT system and UTRGB are highly supportive of advancing research on diabetes and obesity in order to have a real impact on the lives of the people living in South Texas. As you know, the new chancellor of the UT system, uh, Chancellor McCraven, recently visited UTRGB and he noted that he was awestruck by the exceptional quality, speed, and extraordinary diligence and detail with which the institution is taking shape. It is a tremendously exciting time here in Texas. So why did UT form the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute as one of the first entities within UTRGB and the School of Medicine? It was formed to address some of the most critical public health problems facing the residents of South Texas by bringing state-of-the-art resources and specialized expertise to the battle to improve health in the valley. Diabetes, as I mentioned, is a major public health problem facing not only the valley, but the U.S. as a whole. In the nation, it is the seventh leading cause of death. Over 29 million U.S. residents are living with diabetes, and it's estimated that an additional 8 million have diabetes but don't know that they have the disease. In the Rio Grande Valley, approximately 76,000 individuals are struggling with diabetes. The prevalence of the disease in this area, which is about 26%, is one of the highest in the nation, and this disease is costly. 
approximately $720 million are spent each year on health care services associated with diabetes in the Valley. Diabetes and obesity are reaching crisis levels here, with over 50% of individuals coping with obesity. <coughs> the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute was formed to, face, to address this health crisis. Its mission is to advance the health of South Texas and the world through cutting-edge research on diabetes, obesity, and related disorders. The strengths of a scientific research institution, like the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute, come from the scientists who work at that institute. The creativity, energy, and productivity of a research enterprise comes from the investigators who are directing and conducting the research. Our research came as a team uh, to the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute, and that research team included 22 scientists with doctoral degrees and 10 technical support staff, including research assistants and computer programmers. This research team includes world leaders in research on obesity, diabetes, and related disorders who together have published hundreds of papers on the scientific literature. They've also done quite well in terms of funding. Collectively, over the past 15 years, the members of this research team have generated over $200 million in funding from the National Institutes of Health which is the primary funder of biomedical research in the U.S. In addition, these same individuals generated over $16 million to support research during that same period of time from industry and private funding organizations, such as the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association. So it's a highly successful research team. The investigators have generated funding from a broad range of institutes within the National Institutes of Health, including the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the National Institute for Mental Health, the National Institute for Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. The investigators in our institute have a very broad research agenda which branches out from that central focus on diabetes and obesity. These two disorders are correlated with cardiovascular disease, infectious disease, and psychiatric disease, all of which are areas of focus by the investigators who have moved to the valley. In addition, we have major efforts associated with building the tools that are needed to conduct biomedical research, including statistical methods development and animal model development. In addition to having a broad range of research interests, the team also conducts research in a wide range of geographic areas. Um, we study populations on every continent, with the exception of Antarctica. So what is attracting these individuals to the valley? It is the opportunity to have a major impact on both uh, science and the local community. Diabetes and obesity and the associated disorders are major public health problems here, particularly in the Mexican-American population. Through the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute, we have the opportunity to conduct research that ultimately will enhance health in the region. I'd like to take some time now to introduce you to the senior members of the research team and give you a feel for the breadth of research that they can conduct. This highly productive group of scientists is driving a wide range of research initiatives that will have major impacts on both science and health. I'm very proud of them and the work that they have done. And I think you'll see that these individuals bring tremendous talent to the Valley that will be a great benefit to the scientific community here. John Wangero is a world leader in statistical genetics. He developed the solar software package for genetic analysis, which has over 5,000 registered users. He has published over 500 papers in the scientific literature, and in the past 15 years has generated over $75 million in research funding. He is a leader in the use of parallel processing for computer-intensive analysis of genetic data and developed an 8,000 processor computer cluster in San Antonio. 
He is leading the effort to develop a larger cluster here in the valley that will also be dedicated to human genetic analysis. A researcher with a long history of interest in minority health, particularly in heart disease in Mexican Americans, John is the leader of the San Antonio Family Heart Study. This study, now in its 25th year, is looking at the genetic determinants of risk factors for heart disease in about 80 large extended Mexican American families, a total of about 3,000 people living in San Antonio. Uh, Dr. Blangero also worked in Nepal studying genetic factors influencing obesity, growth and development in a population living in the mountainous region of Jiri, Nepal. Dr. Laura Almasi is joining us also. She's an expert in genetic epidemiology and genetic analysis. In addition to her extensive work on the genetics of psychiatric disease, she has conducted significant research on the genetic determinants of characteristics associated with heart disease, obesity, and diabetes. Laura has generated over $18.8 million in funding to support her research over the last 15 years and has reported the results of her studies in 290 papers. So in addition to her work uh, on U.S. minority populations, she's also studied schizophrenia in Costa Rica and the genetics of thrombosis in Spain. Dr. Rector Aria was here in the Valley for quite some time, uh, left to do work in San Antonio for several years, and has now returned to the Valley again to study diabetes and obesity in Mexican Americans. He's published 38 papers, primarily focused on diabetes, and is an expert in statistical genetic analysis. Dr. Joanne Curran um, is an Australian scientist who has made her home in Texas. She's a world leader in genetic studies of diabetes and obesity and has conducted research with the Mexican American families who participated in the San Antonio Family Heart Study. She's published over 90 papers in the scientific literature and has generated over $12 million in NIH funding just since 2007. Dr. Ravi Gugarala is internationally recognized for his research on diabetes in Mexican American adults and children. He has published over 120 papers reporting the results of his research and in the past 15 years has generated over $15 million in research funding. He is the leader of the San Antonio Family Diabetes Study and the Family Gallbladder Study, and his most recent research activities have focused on studies of genetics of risk factors for obesity and diabetes in children. Dr. Christopher Jenkinson is an outstanding molecular geneticist who is a professor of health <coughs> science center in San Antonio. He was very excited about the potential to have a major impact down here and become involved in major collaborative research programs in the Valley, so joined us in January. Um, he brings specialized expertise in both molecular genetics and diabetes, and has published more than 74 papers in the scientific literature. Uh, Dr. Matt Johnson is a highly successful young scientist who is focused on developing an innovative research program on the genetics of eye health and eye diseases, including diabetic retinopathy. He brings outstanding skills in molecular genetics to the programs here in the Valley and already has published over 50 papers and has generated over $5.7 million in research funding since 2012. Uh, Dr. Sandra Laston is an anthropologist and a nurse whose research is focused on the genetics of obesity, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes in U.S. minority populations, including Native Americans and Eskimos. No place is too cold or too hard to get to for this intrepid researcher who rarely complains about her working conditions. Although she has said she is very happy to now be working in a somewhat warmer climate. <laughs> Dr. Michael Mahaney also is an anthropologist by training. He's an expert in the genetic determinants of obesity, cardiovascular disease, and bone-related disorders, and has conducted <laughs> extensive research on heart disease in Mexican Americans as part of the San Antonio Family Heart Study. He's published over 155 papers and has generated 
of $13.8 million in funding. John Vandenberg is a senior member of our team. He's a world leader in research on cardiovascular disease and in research on animal model development. He's generated over $71.2 million in research funding since 2000, published over 365 papers in the scientific literature. His research has taken him around the world as he conducted studies of heart disease in Brazil and collaborated on our research in Nepal, where his non-scientific skills often came in handy. <laughs> and his work in animal model development led to the widespread use of this animal, the Brazilian opossum, Monodelphus domestica, in a wide variety of research areas, including research on fatty liver disease. And finally, there's me. Um, my work has included research on heart disease and aging, in addition to a major focus on the genetic determinants of susceptibility to infectious diseases. I've developed two major research sites in Nepal and Brazil that support long-term studies of parasitic diseases. I've worked in Nepal since 1985 with a population called the Jirals. And today we have over 2,600 living individuals who participate in our studies there. And all 2,600 individuals belong to a single large extended family that's incredibly powerful for genetic studies. Our research effort in Nepal began with studies of parasitic diseases and has expanded significantly over the years as research has progressed on infectious diseases uh, with new collaborators and new interests coming in um, we've conducted genetic studies, um, growth and development, bone structure and function, psychiatric disease, and dental disease in the general population. And last year, we started our newest project in Nepal, focused on the genetics of eye diseases in the population. I've also worked extensively in Brazil, where I study a family of 1,700 individuals, again, all in one giant family, which is wonderful for genetic studies. And there we've studied Chagas disease, which results from a parasitic infection, which are Panosoma cruzi, and causes progressive heart disease. Both the parasite and the bug, which transmit the disease, are present here in Texas, and Chagas disease is increasingly being recognized as an important border health issue. I've also been fortunate to have the opportunity to work on genetic studies in the Middle East and in Africa. So that tells you a bit about our research team at the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute. It does include experts in the disease areas of diabetes, obesity, heart disease, psychiatric disease, and infectious disease. And in terms of technical capabilities, the team includes experts in genetic epidemiology, statistical genetics, bioinformatics, molecular genetics, and stem cell biology. Because of the team's heavy focus on genetics, we will initiate our research programs at the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute with studies of the genetic determinants of risk for obesity, diabetes, and related disorders. So why study genetics? Genetic research allows you to identify biological pathways involved in disease that can then be targeted for the development of new treatments for disease. Ultimately, the information generated through genetic research can lead to the development of new, more effective drugs that might better control diabetes and obesity. Additionally, genetic research allows the development of markers for risk for disease. So knowing who is genetically most likely to develop disease allows you to target available treatments and interventions to those who are most at risk. So in the case of diabetes, behavioral and dietary interventions could be targeted to those individuals most at risk for developing the disease. In order to conduct our research, we need some sophisticated tools to help us decipher the genetic code that regulates risk for disease. And one of these tools is our computer cluster. As I mentioned earlier, John Blangera has significant experience in developing these types of computing clusters here with our old type of machines. And to facilitate our research here, we'll be building one of the world's largest computing clusters dedicated to human research 
on the campus at UT Brownsville. This important research tool will be available to other investigators in the Valley who collaborate with us in research on diabetes and obesity, and also will provide important training opportunities to the medical students and computer science students who will get involved in our research. In addition to state-of-the-art computing tools that the Institute will develop, we will develop a state-of-the-art high-throughput sequencing capabilities to enable us to efficiently characterize the entire genomes of individuals who participate in the studies. Again, this is another important scientific and educational resource that is being brought to the Valley in association with the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute. The scientific research tools and the expertise available at the Institute will be used to advance both science <coughs> and the health of our local community. We want to recruit families from the Valley to participate in our genetic studies and to collaborate with us in the search for improved treatments for diabetes and obesity. Participants in these studies receive benefit from the medical exams that are part of the study protocol and for many behavioral, dietary, or other interventions that are part of the study design. Now I've talked quite a bit about the expertise that will be present in the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute. Our team does include world leaders in research who will focus their energies on making discoveries that ultimately will enhance the health of the region. However, we don't want just the experts at the Institute working to address the public health problems of this area. We want experts from around the world to also focus on health issues that plague the valley. And we will enhance our research through collaborations with scientists from research institutions and other universities across the country and around the world. The team of scientists at the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute already collaborate with investigators at over 100 institutions across the world. There's also a lot of expertise here in the Valley with outstanding researchers at local institutions. The scientists at the STDOI will actively work to expand their collaborations with local researchers and students in order to maximize research opportunities and research results. For example, Joe McCormick and Sue Fisher Hawk work on the Brownsville campus of the UT School of Public Health. Interestingly, they spent the majority of their careers working on viruses like Ebola and high containment when they decided to make a change and come here to work on diabetes and obesity. Their dedicated efforts resulted in the recruitment of 3,000 individuals from Cameron County who participate in a variety of collaborative studies. And already members of our research team are working closely with Drs. McCormick and Fisher Hoff on the genetic determinants of, obesity, of diabetes and obesity in their population. The research expertise, tools, and capabilities present at the Institute and to be developed in the future will provide a powerful base for launching new research efforts in the Valley. These efforts will bring new funding and new talent to the region in addition to benefiting the residents of the area who participate in the research conducted. One of the first new research efforts we want to get off the ground here is the recruitment of families from the Valley who are related to families already participating in the San Antonio Family Heart Study. And we'll be seeking large extended families living here who are willing to collaborate with us in the search for genes influencing diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and a variety of other diseases. The long-term genetic epidemiological studies we hope to conduct here will have both immediate and long-term impacts on health and health care. The genetic studies we hope will ultimately lead to new treatments and new interventions to combat diabetes and obesity. So where do we want to see the Institute five years from now? We want to be clearly considered one of the world's leading centers for research on diabetes and obesity by that point in time. And we want 
had to have expanded the team of outstanding research scientists in order to increase the speed of discovery and the range of scientific discoveries that can be made. In five years, the Institute will have state-of-the-art resources for sequencing and computing that will serve the needs of the Institute's scientists and their collaborators and students. We will have established strong collaborations with investigators based at both local institutions and based at institutions around the world. And we will have genetic family studies based in the Rio Grande Valley ongoing. Research such as that conducted at the Institute builds capacity. Every time a scientist embarks on a new research endeavor, new skills and capabilities need to be developed. That means with each new project, a range of expertise available for future activities increases. Research also leads to the development of infrastructure, which is needed to support projects. As I mentioned earlier, in order to move our projects to the valley, we needed to develop our computing and sequencing centers. Um, the cluster will facilitate rapid statistical analysis of huge volumes of genetic data to be generated by the investigators based at the Institute. The infrastructure available by, developed by these programs is available to other collaborators here and elsewhere who can then grow their research programs even further. As the infrastructure develops, you simultaneously have growth in the workforce. More studies and more equipment require more labor to run, and that labor must be highly skilled. Skilled technical support is required for all these research efforts, resulting in the implementation of training programs. And training occurs not only at the technical level, we're also training the next generation of researchers. Now the ultimate goal of our genetic research is not simply to know that genes are involved in determining susceptibility to disease, rather we're seeking new treatments and new therapies for disease. So how does genetic information help with that? Once you know the genes involved in disease, you have new information on the biological pathways associated with disease, and that can provide you with new targets for pharmacological intervention. The novel biological pathways may be druggable with existing drugs that are currently used for other purposes, or you may be discovering new drugs through, uh, through use of those targets. So that part of the research builds ties with industry. The research that will be conducted at the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute will impact growth in a number of areas, including research collaborations, research capacity, research infrastructure, the skilled workforce, and ties with industry. This is a very exciting time for research on diabetes and obesity and for the development of science in the Rio Grande Valley. The, science, the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute is well positioned to be a strong partner in building the healthcare and bioscience infrastructure in the valley. The Institute also has an important role to play in the medical school. We've all heard the term personalized medicine thrown around for some years now. The UTRGV Medical School will be in a position of great strength for training medical students in genetics and in personalized medicine. The doctors who graduate from UTRGV School of Medicine will be knowledgeable in genomic science and will be well prepared to be at the cutting edge of tomorrow's medicine. So where will we be in 20 years? In 2035, the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute will be well established as one of the world's leading research centers focused on diabetes and obesity. The Institute will have well-established, long-term, unique family studies ongoing with recruitment that is active in the Valley. The Institute's scientists will be involved in world-class collaborations and will be offering unique training opportunities to medical students, graduate students, and undergraduate students. The Institute, in conjunction, in conjunction with the uh, School of Medicine, will have world-class training programs in medical genetics and genetic epidemiology. 
But importantly, in 20 years, the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute will be conducting research that is improving health in South Texas and throughout the world. Today, however, the Institute is providing us with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to build an extraordinary research program from the ground up The focus on diabetes and obesity in this region of the country, where the need is so great, means that our research programs will have real impact on people's lives both today and into the future. It was the amazing opportunities associated with the UTRGV Medical School and at South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute that made 32 researchers decide to make the Valley their home. The UTRGV Medical School went through an external review last week, and the reviewers commented on the extraordinary level of enthusiasm and commitment to the UTRGV School of Medicine mission and to the vision for its future that was expressed by the faculty associated with the school. Dean Fernandez, who is the founding dean of the School of Medicine, sent out a note congratulating the faculty on such a successful series of meetings. A flurry of responses ensued that I think demonstrates what an amazing point of time we are at the School of Medicine. <coughs> One response stated that great teamwork guided by a common purpose continues to inspire and propel this journey, a journey that will lead to a brighter and healthier future for the Rio Grande Valley and South Texas. Another faculty member commented that it was a distinct pleasure and honor to be in such great company at such a pivotal time in the history of the Rio Grande Valley and UTRGV. The enthusiasm for what is being developed here is infectious and is indicative of what Dean Fernandez calls the vibrant collaborative spirit of UTRGV. The Rio Grande Valley was called the Magic Valley in the early 20th century because of the abundant land available for settlers. Now in the 21st century, it is again a magical time in the valley. The members of the South Texas Diabetes and Obesity Institute feel honored to have the opportunity to contribute to the economic and scientific growth of this region and to improving the health care of the people who live here. I'd like to um, thank you for your attention and introduce a few members of our team who are also here tonight and will who say just a few words about their work at the Institute and then we'll all be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, the scientists who are here are John Blanchero, Matt Johnson, and Sandy Lass. Why don't we have them stand up so that we can see their front instead of their back? Thank you, y'all. Like Sarah said, it's a great pleasure to be in the Valley, and she mentioned something from starting from the ground up that's not really correct because the UT system has seen fit to fund this program at a very high level and basically enabling us to drop a world-class research program, highly competitive, into the Valley at once. So we're, we're kind of start, starting hitting the ground running. Now, the kinds of things that I do, uh, I thought I'd just give you a little explanation. Everybody knows about the Human Genome Project, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Human Genome is basically the book of life. It's written in three billion base pairs in every cell in your body, in the DNA. Each of those three billion base pairs have four different potential bases, right? So there's a lot of variation. We don't all look the same, and yet we all identify ourselves as being quite similar. So all that unique variation is somewhere written in the genome, and that's just little changes in those bases that lead to all the observed human variability that we see. So along with all the outward signs of variation that we see in our physiognomy and whatnot, we also have these hidden variations that affect our risk for disease. And everybody knows about this because I guarantee everybody knows families that have predilections towards certain diseases. You know, families that have Parkinson's disease, you know, families that have excess heart disease, you know, families that have lots of excess diabetes. It's just a natural thing we all come to know. And those variations, the reason for that kind of variation is written in the genome. 
And what we do is we study these interesting families and we try to find the bits of DNA that are different that pass from parents to offspring. And we track those using these very elaborate mathematical models that require lots and lots of brute force computation. That's why we need those elaborate kinds of biocomputing that, that Sarah was showing you. So uh, when the human genome started, it took us about a little over 10 years to get the first book written, the very first person sequenced. Now we can do it in a day. It costs about a billion dollars to do it the first time. Now we do it for about a thousand dollars, a little bit over a thousand dollars. So we're very lucky that we're going to have a high throughput human genome sequencing center here in Brownsville. Uh, Matt's, uh, we've already taken delivery on a couple of these machines. They cost more than a typical mansion does, uh, but they're amazing capability and we will be sequencing thousands of individuals. Uh, we were at the very forefront of this kind of effort. We are leaders in a big project uh, run by the National Institutes of Health called the T2D Genes Project, where we've already sequenced whole genome sequences on, on uh, more than 2,500 individuals. And considering we only had six individuals sequenced, you know, less than 10 years ago, it's amazing how fast things are changing. The other area that I want to mention that Sarah just brought up briefly is that we're going to have an absolutely path-breaking program in the area of stem cell research. And the area that we're particularly focusing on for this is something that we call induced pluripotent stem cells. Everybody knows that stem cells are kind of the, the base, the basal cell that can be turned into any other kind of cell. They're really kind of the, the tabula rasa cell that holds the promise for much potential medical intervention in the future because uh, stem cells can be turned into other kinds of cells. Those other kinds of cells can be used to replace bad cells that might be parts of disease. So we're coming in with a very novel, very innovative, very daring program where we're going to make stem cells on, uh, uh, from basic blood cells. We can turn blood cells into stem cells. And we're going to and get these on all of the people who come into our studies, and then we're going to turn them into cells that we can study more deeply. Cells that might be difficult for us to access generally. So we do a lot of work on the brain, and people are very hesitant to let us open up their brains and take bits of tissue out, right? So we can't get neurons from people in that way, but we can turn blood cells into neurons and study the cellular physiology. This is going to let us do things that we never thought possible. And it's also going to give us all sorts of ideas as to how we're got that kind of technology and how the genes that we find that influence those cellular phenotypes could potentially lead to uh, very novel um, medical interventions. This is going to be a unique program down here. As I say, it's at the very, very forefront of this technology, and we intend to do this on a very large, even epidemiological scale. So that's kind of the, 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 the two big areas that I'm coming out of. And uh, as I said, I think uh, the Valley is going to be an absolutely major uh, player in genetic research uh, within the next year. Um, Good evening, everyone, and firstly, thank you for welcoming us down here. You'd be much more um, delightful welcome. I'm actually glad that I'm now down here physically. It's been a long process, but we're now down here and taking care of things. Um, with me, I, I consider this new stuff down here coinciding with a new research program that I'm developing. And as Sarah um, alluded to, it's in looking at the genetics of eye disease, normal, normal health of your vision, poor vision and the genetics of blindness. Now, diabetes, we, we know, is a prime factor for the likes of diabetic retinopathy. But you may or may not know that diabetes can also influence the risk of developing cataracts and also glaucoma. It is known to have uh, risk factors for those other two eye diseases. And it's interesting that with especially glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy, you don't really know you have that until it's more or less too late, where you've already suffered some irrecoverable vision loss. 
And so with identifying the genetics that have influenced these diseases, it's a matter of trying to get to that point way before any irrecoverable vision loss occurs. Um, and also to, um, in addition to what John mentioned about the stem cells, uh, that's a very prominent area of research in eye health as well. There's already stem cell research um, that um, administering uh, stem cells into the eye to sort of correct factors for macular degeneration. Uh, so that's going to be a highly prevalent topic and a hot topic in the, it is now, if not in the, in the not too distant future. So again, thank you for your welcome down here. I'm looking forward to getting stuck back into the work. I'm over the moving house part. I just want to get stuck into doing some science and, and research. Thank you. And I'm Sandy Lapp, and as Sarah mentioned, I'm a registered nurse, and uh, later in life I went back to be a medical anthropologist. I've done community health research in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and the Spums. I worked in Nepal. More recently, now that I started working at Texas Biomed, I worked in Alaska, as you saw the pictures, and with American Indians in the Dakotas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Arizona. Um, I've also worked with obese, obesity of children in Houston with the Viva La Familia project. And um, John was mentioning about the study of genetics and what I've been doing at, in Alaska and the other studies is collecting the pedigree information. We need to know who's related to who because if someone has diabetes in the family and someone doesn't, we need to know those relationships. So that's what I'll be busy doing here down in the valley, uh, doing household visits and collecting that information. Um, I'm very happy to be living and working in the valley, and I don't think I'll miss the trips to Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'd all be happy to answer any questions anybody okay, can have. Sarah, uh, I'm going to uh, suggest a couple of things. Uh, Davis is going to uh, work on the question and answer, and there's a portable mic right here. Well, and uh, uh, if you will uh, kind of do that, why don't some of you move forward so that we can hear you better and uh, we can open the question and answer. Uh, Dr. Sarah assured me she is not a minister, therefore you don't have to sit in the back pew. You can't well, well, all those are on the test, that's what they want to <laughs> so, so just come on up so you can hear better and we can hear your question. And when you think you've got enough here, Davis, go for it. All right, who has a question? I'm the noodle the expert. You're never going to get another chance like this. They're going to have magnetic lock doors. You won't be able to get in. And yes, ma'am. Well, I'm kind of, I'm just kind of interested in as just an ordinary citizen. What's the first thing that I might become aware of that you guys are down here doing all this exciting stuff? And I didn't come to the future of McAllen meeting, so I don't know about that. But just living out there. When am I going to uh, know you're here and, wow, something is happening? What's going to happen? Um, we are working to um, develop outreach to the community that will explain what our research is doing and outline the opportunities we have for participation in the studies. Um, once we get finally settled, and as I think you appreciate from what people have said, we've had a huge <laughs> moving operation in the last couple of months. But once we get settled, we want to have a website up that is describing the information um, that we're generating, talking about our current research efforts and our new directions that we want to go in. And we want to use that website to attract students to participate in our studies from the university. We want to use it to inform the medical school of what we're doing, and we want it to be a tool for the community, for people who want to participate in the studies, to reach out to us and uh, indicate their interest in becoming participants. Probably what you're most likely to run into us now is when we're running around shopping as we're trying to find all the things that we need. I mean, everybody's living out of boxes right now. That's the, even in the, the laboratories. We're just now starting to unpack the laboratories and all our, our 
new toys and getting those all up and running. But we did bring up quite a few projects with us, so uh, we should be doing some real science here in the next, really in the next month or so. Where are you all going to be physically? If something's in Brownsville, a computer, where's the institute going to be? So the institute is uh, distributed across campuses. We have um, a series of office and laboratories on the UT Brownsville campus, and then some offices and laboratories on the UTPA campus in what's currently the Health Science Center of San Antonio's Edinburgh Regional Academic Health Center. And we're really looking forward to when it's all UTRGV and easier to say. <laughs> I guess you just talk a little bit more about the funding mechanism and uh, what brought you here and uh, you know the permanence of that and you know ideas for growth. So our funding is generated from the National Institutes of Health. Um, we received a very um, good startup package from UT System to help us get the projects moved here off the ground. Um, but we're already actively applying to get funding from a variety of sources including um, various institutes in the National Institutes of Health. We also put in a collaborative uh, application with the group from the School of Public Health in Brownsville to the American Heart Association. And so um, we're working hard to generate additional funding to grow the programs uh, rapidly. Just clearly, uh, UT system invested a, a lot of money that's in the, the tens of millions to, to jumpstart this process and to move such a large group in basically in one big cluster hire. So it was a, yeah, they saw the opportunity and, and uh, uh, they took it and I think it's gonna be the best possible thing for a new medical school to start off with a very mature scientific program versus typically it takes decades to, to uh, be able to uh, really be competitive in the larger uh, uh, scientific competitive funding uh, uh, arena. Let me be, let me be crass, who, who you'll report to? The National Institutes of Health or the UT system? No, we report to um, the School of Medicine. So to the dean of the school of medicine. Mr. Fernandez. Yes. Yeah. Who's going to own the genetic materials and the information that you all are going to discover? Yeah. Talk about it. Uh, the participants always own their own data, right? So and uh, uh, they're involved in all steps. For some reason, someone decides they don't want to be part of it after they've already joined. It can be removed. But basically, scientific data, especially funded by the public, needs to be widely shared across scientists. So there's many, that's why you have all these collaborations with other scientists. This data needs to be looked at by uh, as many people who can find interesting discoveries out of it. So. The National Institutes of Health have moved into broad data sharing amongst professional scientists with all the uh, caveats of protections because some of this data sometimes can end up being sensitive. Uh, uh, identifiable data is typically not part of the record, so uh, individual uh, identities aren't, aren't there. But you know, genetic data is ultimately something that everybody's absolutely unique. But at this point, we don't have the map between people and those genomes. But basically, data sharing is the way that science really moves forward. So data will typically be broadly shared. What kind of participation do you expect from the local community in your research? We really encourage people to participate. Um, of course, it's, it's something that's totally voluntary, so we'll just have to see. Um, in our San Antonio studies, we've had fantastic cooperation from the community. 
Um, we've had families who've participated now for up to 25 years. Um, we have a newsletter that goes out and the uh, recruiters who are continually reaching out to the population. Um, we do get calls from individuals who say, you haven't seen me in a couple of years, when's the next time I'm going to get to participate? Uh, in our work in the Paul of Brazil, we've had um, incredible participation over the years. Um, so we've, we've been very fortunate in, in good participation from all the communities we've worked with. I apologize because I came late and you may have answered this question already, but did you say who you want to have participate in the study? Is it a particular profile? So we, our, our strength has been looking at um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity in minority populations. So we're primarily interested in Mexican-American populations. However, we're looking at expanding our research to um, look at families that have a, a, a dense distribution from not unusual phenotype. So if a family has a cluster of, like John suggested, Parkinson's disease or some other disease, where it's clearly segregating in the family, that's a family we'd be interested in looking at also. How long before you get a cure for diabetes? <laughs> well, unfortunately, that, It'll you be know, a shot or a pill. basic research takes many, many years, and so that's something for future generations. But I do think that um, we can make significant progress on treatment of the disease over the next I do think in diabetes that uh, stem cells might start to, within the, within a decade, you might see stem cell treatments. And how would that? So, so basically, when you have type 2 diabetes for an extended period, a period your pancreas basically stops making insulin. The cells, the, there's a cell in the pancreas called the beta cell that's the most responsible for the, the production of insulin. And there's a lot of work going on now in trying to turn stem cells into those specific kinds of cells. So potentially, stem cells might be able to seed the pancreas, be induced to make these new cells so that people wouldn't have to rely on exogenous insulin. So very hard work. That's true both for type 2 and for type 1 diabetes, the, the juvenile kind. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, I, we are, we're living in an extraordinary time in terms of, you know, we cracked the human genome and now we're cracking the secrets of the cell. And uh, basically all disease ultimately comes down to the cellular level. So if we can, if we can put new cells in, then a lot of things are going to be improved. Well, uh, I was wondering if a person wanted to be a part of your population study, and they're just out here, uh, would they tell their doctor? Will you be working with doctors in the area to identify your people, or how do you go about? Yeah, so as we get established, we want to work with um, physicians, social workers, other people who are working in the community already to get out the information about who we are, what we're doing, and what the opportunities for involved. So, so we have a lot of that groundwork to do first. And so I think it will be quite some time, uh, probably at least a year before we start recruiting here. But we're going to start making that outreach to the various members of the community who can start getting us linked up with people uh, as soon as possible. But would they go to their doctor and yeah, say, sure. I'd you like to go to the doctor, you can go to the website. You, I mean, so you can reach out to us. You out to the physicians who can refer you. There's lots of ways in which this could work. And we, and we reach out directly because some of these studies are very formal in how the sampling is done. Like in San Antonio, we chose particular uh, neighborhoods randomly and then went in and, and spoke to people household by household. So there'll be a broad, a broad range of studies, so all sorts of potential ascertainments. I've got a, in addition to what John mentioned, with my eye research program, I know collaborators up at the Health Science Centre in San Antonio have a bus. It's like a mobile eye clinic. 
And so I've had thoughts that we can get that mobile clinic down here and actually go to the people themselves. So sort of that sort of obviously make people aware of us, but sort of take them up the clinic to them sort of thing, where we're set up to um, do a full buy exam from people in a central location and sort of move it around the valley. Your research group was comprised of 28 people, I believe you said. I didn't see any of medical degrees. Have you collaborated previously in other venues? And how many were imported from San Antonio? So all of our investigators came from San Antonio. Um, we have had strong connections with MDs throughout all of our research because, of course, we're doing human subjects research. We have medical exams as part of the studies. It's critical that we have physicians involved who understand the biology and who can help us work with the patients. Um, we actually do have a couple of non-practicing MDs on our staff, but the majority are PhDs. What are the solutions you're setting for breakfast and the one be part of the could you restate your question with the mic, please? Uh, what are the solutions you're setting for subjects that want to be part of the, of the program or the research? Yes, yeah, the solutions. So you are looking at the, at the middle, of middle class population or upper uh, class? So we're mainly interested in, in families. So as John said, there are a variety of approaches you can use for um, sampling individuals. Population based, where you're going into a community and doing every fourth household. You can be going to every household looking for people who have meet the criteria that they have two brothers, um, both parents, and a, uh, some offspring that are alive. You know, so it, it can vary a great deal. So depending upon the, the disease that's under study, the sampling scheme might vary. I'm a retired um, public school teacher, um, and most of my years at the high school level. And as I'm listening to this, I'm like, you guys could really have do fascinating things to reach out to our high school students and get them interested. And I wonder if you're going to be doing that. Um, we would love to have outreach to high school students. Um, when we were at our previous institution, we did a lot of tours for high school students and a lot of lectures for high school students and invited them in regularly to visit um, the institution. And that would be something we'd be interested in doing here. It's a great idea. Uh, are you going to um, talk to people across the border? Because we have a lot of families who are distributed on both sides of the border, so, yeah? Yeah, but, I mean, yes, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, during your presentation, you mentioned Mexican American. What about the uh, undocumented population living in the valley? Uh, are you going to be including them as part of your research? Again, it depends on if they're uh, falling into the families and, and the sampling scheme that we're using. To well, usually there is a mix of you know Mexican Americans and undocumented. Right. They they wouldn't be excluded. That's for sure. So if they're interested in participating, then of course we assure appropriate confidentiality. It's definitely not something that we ask. So <laughs> are there many more are there many other institutes like yours doing diabetes and obesity research in minority populations? Minority. On the pop to mind. Yeah, I think it's gonna be pretty unique. There you know, clearly Texas has had there, you know, there are there are institutions in Arizona and Texas who just naturally tend towards uh, uh, that sort of uh, work because of the local population. But uh, I think we're probably going to start off being one of the, the, the largest and and uh, better known ones right from day one. I know the National Institutes of Health are absolutely delighted with with the setup. So. UT would follow us more quick. UT had a program, I thought, a few years ago of if a professor developed something that was exploitable in the market, uh, I'm thinking of the lady who invented 
something with nanotechnology to make it faster and cheaper to get the fibers, that they would be able to participate in the resulting business that was formed or somehow make money out of it. Is that, are they still doing that? Or are y'all going to be, if you, get, if, you, if you hit the jackpot and get, get something that's really good, we won't be able to participate in it. A lot of our work is done highly collaboratively and it's funded by the National Institutes of uh, Health. So a lot of it is in the public domain. Um, there are some potential very downstream patentable things, I suppose, but that really hasn't been a big focus for us given the type of research we're doing. Yeah, I think that's a As I mentioned to you earlier, I'm very much interested in getting all of our resources working together. How are you going to work with other groups in the Valley who are working in this field, such as Texas A&M uh, with Olga Gabriel back here, and Olga, I'm sure, could tell you of other groups down here working in this area. You've mentioned, yes, you would like to work with high schoolers. Uh, you haven't made those contacts yet, I assume, but I'm primarily interested in how you are going to interface with the excellent work that uh, Olga Gabriel's group has been doing with Texas A&M Health Initiatives. So we uh, always have been highly collaborative and really interested in how we can working with other investigators, both at institutions in the U.S., across town, across multiple states, so um, coming here, having the opportunity to work with the researchers who are here, in a, and they're here in a variety of settings, both um, the School of Public Health, Doctors Hospital, there are all kinds of areas where you have scientists working on these problems here. We think that's great. We want to collaborate across all those institutions. And, and we've only been here a short period of time, so it's taken a while to build up the contacts, but uh, yeah. And you insist on unpacking your suitcase before you get down to this. <laughs> One more student has a question. <laughs> you mentioned that a lot of the research that you'll be doing will, of course, be disseminated to this medical school. Um, how will you all particularly participate in the curriculum as, it's, as it gets started? So a couple of us have roles as um, directors of components. So John is uh, the acting director for the neuroscience component because of his work on um, brain structure and function. Um, our main role will be in providing those research opportunities to medical students who get them involved in research projects um, at a variety of levels, whether they want to do um, community level epidemiological studies or they want to do more basic laboratory-based uh, investigations. We have a huge range of opportunities for involvement with students in this. Would you all be as uh, participating as professors or as well? So all of us have appointments as professors in the medical school, and everybody does have a percentage of their time that they're required to devote to teaching. So yes. So uh, with regard to the genome, I have a question. So how often are y'all gonna be taking biological specimens from the participants? And is there some way that possibly the genome can maybe mutate over time? And are you guys going to be collecting data like for specimen every year, every five years to observe those changes and see if there's anything going on? You wanna talk about this? Sure. So, uh, we do do longitudinal studies. By longitudinal means we follow people uh, across time. Typically it's on a five year cycle and that's primarily because that's kind of how funding goes. We get grants that are five years at a time. So five years is a natural cycle. Uh, we primarily focus on uh, uh, germline DNA, which doesn't really alter, okay? So you're, you're thinking of uh, in your somatic cells, those are changing. Cancer is a result of, of local changes in the genome. Uh, we're primarily geneticists. We're primarily looking at the transmissible stuff, which is stable. That said, uh, 
the system does not have perfect fidelity. Every one of us has about 80 new mutations that your parents don't have. And it turns out that some of these end up being important. And because we work at families, it's the only kind of design where you can actually identify those brand new mutations that didn't appear in either family. So we do that sort of work. Besides genetics, we do we work in the broader area of genomics, and some of that is relevant because there are aspects of the genome, especially so-called epigenetic aspects of the genome, that are uh, uh, that that do alter in the presence of environmental challenges. So some of those things we study, some of the things like methylation of the genome, which can change even within a day, let alone across years. So we do some of those studies. We're very interested in the interaction between the environment and the genome. I mean, everybody knows, take obesity, right? Everybody knows that you must take calories in in order to become obese, right? So that's clearly exogenous. That's the environment. Access to calories is part of the environment. We also know, everybody knows, I know, I wish I was one of those people, that there's just some people can eat whatever they want. It doesn't affect their cholesterols. It doesn't affect their waistline. You know, that's the interaction between their genome and the environment. Some people respond differently to the environment. It's probably the most important thing, in fact, in diseases like diabetes and heart disease. So we don't just, we're not just determinists around the genome, we study it in the broader context of not only the, the, the physical environment, but also the cultural environment, especially when it comes to studying some psychiatric related disorders, where the, where the social and cultural environment are some of the primary triggers for, for things. So, so uh, we're, we're broader than the genome, but always that's where we start. No? One more question. Um, nutritionists say that if you're obese long enough, you're going to have diabetes. And one way to keep people from having diabetes is to have them not be obese. So uh, how do you all relate to that? Yeah, so that's, uh, it, it's actually not true. Uh, well, I would, I, it is true if you say if they live long enough, right? Because we'd all get diabetes if we live long enough, regardless of whether we were we were obese because your cells would wear out. But, but there are certainly individuals who are obese who don't show any of the metabolic derangements that we associate with risk. Okay, so there are there's this there's this one group. On the other hand, you, you basically you're, you're right. The, the biggest public health advance we would have is if we could get people to reduce their their the, the size of their waists and things like that. And then you're talking about either behavioral modification, which we'll be doing trials on. I mean, we literally want to see how people, especially kids, differentially respond to these kinds of behavioral interventions. And then there's always pharmacological interventions, which haven't worked very well yet for obesity, but are always uh, considered to be one of the holy grails. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated disease. Humans are complicated, so we have to consider all possible aspects of it. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, so the Institute is only looking for um, preventative sort of treatments. Uh, you guys working on any surgical aspects? No, we are not working on surgical aspects. Okay. It's more basic, learning the basic biology of the underlying risk than, than uh, that kind of directly <coughs> interventionist. Uh, well, one of the things we are doing is mm -hmm. identifying markers for disease. So markers that pre-disease that tell you that that person is highly disposed. And so then you can target those behavioral and dietary interventions to people who are likely to develop disease. So in that sense, the genetic studies do, do have implications Going. <laughs> so, are y'all looking at um, everybody throughout the course of the lifespan, from you know infants to children to people who are past the age of 65, or is there a specific age group that you're looking at? So we have usually worked in adults. Um, 
some of our investigators have interest in um, childhood disease, and it's possible to work across the lifespan in these types of studies. Um, it, it's very hard to work with children younger than five for just for sampling and practical purposes. And of course, you, all, you want the child to actually want to participate, so you always get assent from the child as well as consent from the parents whenever they're um, our work in Nepal on uh, parasitic diseases enrolled young kids as well, and we were looking because you had a lot of transmission in the young children. Um, and as I said, Robbie Dubarala has this study of risk factors for diabetes in young children in Mexican American children. On the other hand, no? Okay. Um,